Hi, welcome to part five of Sound Basics. In this video, we are looking at uh, the harmonic series. In fact, we've kind of built up to this point. We've looked at resonance and modes of resonance. So right now we're gonna look at modes of the modes of resonance. We're gonna learn about modes of resonance on a single string. So we're gonna take a string and kind of develop a whole fairly complex theory model of sound production in in particular we're going to move towards understanding how we get um, uh, timbre or sound color so why things sound like they do so why does a violin sound like a violin i mean when a violin plays an a the pitch 440 hertz and a flute plays the uh, a pitch 440 hertz they sound uh, the same pitch but they sound different you can tell the difference between a flute and a violin well it, it turns out that you can look at a simple string uh, um, uh, as a you know in, in a from from the physics point of view as a mechanical thing and you can see different modes of resonance within that string and uh, it allows you to construct um, a, a series of tones from one string uh, which we'll come to know as the harmonic series so uh, to start with we're going to look at uh, professor walter lewin uh, who's uh, rest in peace who sadly passed now but he was known as a great edu educator at MIT and he produced this video called The Sounds of Music and he gives a really nice explanation of string modes. So let's hear from Professor Lewin. I wanna give you a short introduction to string instruments. Suppose I have here a string Nice string, you see one here. And I um, hold it firm here and I hold it firm there. Uh, cannot, cannot move for now, like this. But what I'm going to do on this end here, I'm just going to shake it just a little bit, not very much, just a teeny weeny little bit. And I start doing that at very low frequency. You know the word frequency now? Very low frequency. Maybe I do it uh, with two hertz, two oscillations per second. I go to three hertz. String is not doing very much. String is not very happy. It just sits there, looks at me, laughs at me, nothing happens. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, when I increase that frequency, the string responds in a very clear way. You are going to see that. And you'll see that the string goes up like this, and then it goes down, and it happily continues to do this. This vibration, which the system likes very much, we have a name for that, and we call that a resonance frequency. with which the system really likes to oscillate. It didn't like my two hertz, it didn't like my four hertz, but oh boy, oh boy, when I hit a particular frequency, as you will see, then it happily goes boom, 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 like this. We call that a resonance frequency. Also, which is a nice word, we call that a natural frequency. Natural, it's very natural for that string to do this. It doesn't want to go two hertz, it wants to go six hertz. And we call this mode in which it oscillates, we call that the first harmonic. First harmonic. It means it cannot oscillate nicely in its natural way. It cannot oscillate at a lower frequency. That's why we call it the first. Now, sometimes I may misspeak. I try not to. Because some books, some physics books, call this also the fundamental. So I will write it down, but I will try to avoid that word so that we never get confused. First harmonic. So now I go to a little bit higher frequency. I shake it a little faster. And this wonderful mode goes away. It stops. It's, string is not doing much. Sitting there, it's bored. And I go faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden, again, it's very happy. There is another natural frequency. It shows another resonance. And the shape of that string then 
is such that this point, point stands still. And when this is up, this is down. And it goes like this. And you will see that. It's very happy. It's a natural frequency. It loves that frequency. And we call that the second harmonic. So then I go to higher frequencies that in the middle is meant to be in the middle. I go to higher frequency, shaking it. Frequencies go away. I don't see this one. I don't see this one. But then all of a sudden, a third one comes in. And the third one, you've guessed it, is going to look like this. This point stands still, and this stands still. And when this is down, this is up, and then this is down. And this is called the third harmonic. And I could go on. I get a whole series of natural frequencies, a whole series of resonance frequencies, and the string only likes that series. It doesn't like any other. If the frequency, if that were the case, of the lowest possible frequency, which is the first harmonic. If the first harmonic were 100 hertz, and that depends, of course, from instruments to instruments, so I just picked the 100, that's an easy number, then the second harmonic is 200 hertz, and then the third harmonic is 300 hertz. So they come in a very easy series. One, two, three, four, five, etc. This is only true if the first harmonic is 100. If the first harmonic were 400 hertz, well, then the second would be 800, and the third one would be 1200. So once you know what the first harmonic is, sometimes also called the fundamental, but remember, I wasn't going to use that word anymore, uh, then you know the others. Why is it that certain strings have a lower fundamental than other strings? Well, that depends on three things. The first thing that is very important is the length. If you make the string longer, then the first harmonic, lower frequency than the shorter string. The shorter the string, the higher the frequency. Then there is tension in the string. You can take the string and you can do this, put a lot of tension on it, ah, even more, even more, and then it breaks, and you went too far, of course. But you can change the tension. If the tension goes up, the first harmonic also goes up. If the length goes up, the first harmonic goes down. And then there is a third ingredient, and you can see that when you look at violins and when you look at pianos, and that is how much the string weighs. So it is the weight of the string. But if I try to be very precise, and I really have to, because all of you are going to be scientists sooner or later, it is really the weight per foot. It's not just the weight of the whole string that matters, but it is the weight for a section which is, say, as long as a foot. And if I make that go up, then the first harmonic goes also down. So you have three ways if you build an instrument, and you want many, many tones to get out of the instrument, like a piano, then you have three ways of getting your lowest frequency, your harmonic. Being longer, get a lower frequency, you can make the tension lower, you get a lower frequency. You can make the weight per foot higher, you also get a lower frequency. And so you have a lot of room to play with. I have a very special violin string. There's this one. <laughs> now I need some help. I need some help from someone who is strong. 
and who is reliable. That's our. Oh, I got to get I want someone. You're too strong. <laughs> so what is your name? Joseph. Yeah. Joseph, you're strong? Yeah. Are you reliable? Yeah. Good for you. So Marcos, if you can turn the light down a little. We have this, uh, this okay, so if you come a little bit this way, no, that's, that's maybe, well, maybe, maybe that's a little bit. Give me first a little bit of light so that they can get the idea and then we'll, and then we'll make it darker so that you see the robot. So he, no, 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 stay where you are, stay where you are. See, you're not reliable. Go like a brick a little. <laughs> no, stay where you are now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I have this string, it's a very long string, and I give it a certain tension, which I'm not going to change. So, are you comfortable, uh, Joseph? I'll go a little bit further back. Okay, hold it. So we're not going to change the tension, and we're not going to change the length, that's a given, and the, the, the weight per foot is also a given, we're not going to change that. And I'm going to shake it very slowly. And you see, nothing happens. That string is just laughing at us. I mean, it's an insult. <laughs> it's a complete insult. But now I'm going to go faster. Look at my hand. I've increased now the frequency of my hand. I don't go very far. I go faster and faster. And now look. Now look. Now look. Now it's getting there. Now look how happy it is. <laughs> this is the first harmonic. It likes this frequency. And my hand is really not moving very much. Look, look at my hand. It's almost not moving at all. And you see that picture on the board? First harmonic. So now I go a little bit faster. And it starts laughing again. <laughs> nothing. 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 Ah. I went too fast, did I? I want one? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Here. Wow. Second harmonic. Second harmonic. It's very happy. My hand is not moving very much. Second harmonic. Let's now go for the third. I go a little faster. You see, it does nothing. I go a little faster, it does nothing. A little faster. A little faster. There it is. Third harmonic. Two points in the middle are not moving. Not quite in the middle. Two points of the string are just standing still. And of course, Joseph's hand is also standing still. <laughs> and now I'll try to go the highest harmonic that I can possibly generate. And you count. And you tell me then later how many of those mountains and valleys you saw. If you see one point that is not moving, that is already the second harmonic. If there are two points not moving, that's the third harmonic. So if you count four points, it's the fifth harmonic. But I can do better than that. OK. I'm trying to go. See, I must hit this resonance. And when the system. Yeah! No, I lost it. I lost it. Yeah, I got one. I got one. What was it? Fifth harmonic? Yeah, yeah. Sixth harmonic? Do I hear six? <laughs> Do I hear seven? <laughs> Joseph, you and I saw 13, right? <laughs> was the 13th harmonic, right? <laughs> He's also an honest guy. Strong, honest, and reliable. OK, so you see, that's the way that strings behave. and. That's exactly the way that strings behave of musical instruments. Here is a string that we can also oscillate, uh, not by hand, but we, can, we have a little motor here that can make this part go up and down. And the idea is that we're going to put it for you in the third harmonic. And the frequency is so high in the third harmonic that you can really not see that this is up and that this is down. 
goes too fast. You could with the other spring, but not here. And so then we are going to strobe it with strobe light to make you see the string more or less stand still, though not quite, but almost. Let's first see whether we can get it into this harmonic. It's very delicate. We may have to change the frequency. That's pretty good. So you see here a point that is standing still. So two stand still, third harmonic. So it's at resonance now. We call this at resonance. It's at its natural frequency. It's driven there, just the right frequency. See, it goes too fast. You cannot see it stands here, stand, and there. That's too fast. So now we're going to put a strobe light on it. And the strobe light throws light on it, goes on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off, which is about the same frequency. About the same. We cannot exactly get it the same. And so you're going to see now that the, the rope will stand still or slowly move. That's only, of course, an optical illusion. In reality, it goes like this, but it makes it, we make it look stand still. That's the way that we cast the light on it. Okay, if you're ready for it, uh, Marcos. Let's see. Have to turn that off there. So I have a green light strobe on. Where is the, oh, the lecture light is here, right? Okay, look at that. So you see the green, the green um, strobe is at a, frequency very close to the way that the rope is moving, and so it looks like it's standing still. If I, I can try to do a little better, but it's not so easy. I can try to perhaps... No, I went in the wrong direction. It's not so important that I hit it exactly, as long as you get the idea. But what I can also do now, I can turn this into a work of art, and I can put on a second stroboscope in red, which I flash twice as fast. So it illuminates the rope twice during one complete oscillation. So you see the rope double in red and single in green. And let's do that now. I'll have to do the best I can. 590, that becomes 1180. Should be very close now. Should be very close. So you see it twice in red, and you see it once in green. Nice to have that in your living room. Excuse me? Is it because it's slightly out of phase that it came from flattens? See, now it's perfect. Sure, because you see, we cannot exactly hit it at the right frequency. So therefore, you get a phenomenon that it moves very slowly. If we play with it long enough, hey, now the green and the red are almost, you see, they're exactly, they coincide. So I can uh, change that very easily by changing the frequency of the green one a little. And then, of course, the green one will go. So you see also here, apart from the fact that it's a nice sculpture, you see now the idea that there are points here standing still. They have a name, we call them nodes. And there, this system is oscillating now in the third harmonic. It's a natural frequency. We only excite it in one frequency. OK. OK, thanks, Professor Lewin. Here is another demonstration um, of some string standing waves so we can see the various modes of oscillation in this video. Here is the first standing wave or fundamental mode. Notice that half of a wavelength is visible, or another way to say it is twice of the rope's length is one wavelength. The second harmonic has a node in the middle, a place of zero movement and two antinodes, places of large movement, a full wavelength is represented. Now these antinodes are of such large movement that if you touched one, 
you would mess up the whole wave. This is the third harmonic. You'll notice there are now three anti-nodes, of course, and two nodes. You'll also notice that the wavelength is two-thirds of the total length. That's this is one full wavelength. The fourth harmonic shows four anti-nodes and three nodes. A strobe light reveals that two wavelengths are present in the length of the string. Now it's time for a test of what you've learned. For the fifth harmonic, what would the wavelength be? How many nodes would be present and how many anti-nodes? Here we are, the fifth harmonic. One, two, three, four, five anti-nodes. One, two, three, four nodes. And the wavelength is two fifths of the length of the string. We can see in this diagram 32 modes of oscillation. So you see, actually we don't see mode one, where's mode one? But then you see mode two right there. So you don't see the fundamental two. And then, uh, is that three? Yep. And then four, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to 32, all right? And, and you'll notice, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you'll notice that the amplitude of the displacement, right? So now when we're talking about a string, this is like three times confusing because we, we do use this metaphor to show change over time of a sound wave, but this is the actual string. So when we're talking about a string wave, it, it is in fact a transverse wave, right? And when you talk about amplitude, it's the amount of displacement um, uh, perpendicular here, right, to, to the string. So you'll see in mode two, it, it's going to, I guess they're calling it one and negative one, but then in by mode three, you're only getting half of that, okay? And then by mode four, I think it's a little bit over one third or just about one third, right? All right. In this diagram, now we can see the the, uh, the properties of these various modes, right? So that's mode one, and you can see the representation in the longitudinal wave, the, the molecular representation. You notice here uh, at the ends, the what we call the nodes, the particles are not moving at all. And then in the middle there, or the anti-node, the particles have maximum displacement, right? These are where the particles are moving the most. And you can go along the lines all the way here. In mode two, the second harmonic, you notice the, well, I shouldn't move very much in here in the middle somewhere, right? And then maximum movement over here. So, and you'll notice the frequency if the first um, harmonic or the fundamental is 440 hertz, 440 times a second. Uh, first partial is called the fundamental for or the first harmonic. And I know Professor Lewin was very careful about not using the word fundamental because it can be quite confusing, but, but I tend to use it. So it's the first partial, first harmonic. The second is the frequency is twice as much, and we talked about the, it as well. And it's the second uh, harmonic or the second partial, right? And it looks like that. Three, anti, three nodes, two antinodes, et cetera, et cetera. The third will be three times 440 or 1320. And you can see the four nodes, four anti-nodes, and the representation here. And then finally four, and on and on. So you notice these are whole number multiples of the first harmonic or fundamental frequency. So if we look at uh, this diagram right here, we can see that um, the pitches go along with these modes of resonance. Right, so the fundamental, if it, the, if the fundamental is here at two sixty one point six three or C four middle C, right, then the the harmonic, the first harmonic is an octave above. I mean, sorry, the second harmonic. See, there there's that confusion with the fundamental. The second harmonic is going to be an octave above, twice the frequency, and this will be three times the frequency. The third harmonic, right. And it'll be a G, so we go octave, then fifth to the G, and then to another C here, and to a major third, E, and then to another fifth there, and then et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on, all the way up to 16. Okay? So you, 
if you isolated those harmonics, you'd get a, an entirely different pitch. Of course, it's oscillating at a different frequency. And here we go uh, again, another overview right here. The um, if the fundamental, or the first partial, or the first harmonic is going to be sixty-five hertz. You have C one, and then C two is one thirty, and then G, and then C, and then E three, then G three, B flat three, C four, D four, and so on, and so on, and so on. So again. Uh, with those modes of resonance. So if you think about the string, these are just the natural overtones and the natural harmonics of the string. And they just happen to oscillate at whole number ratios of the fundamental frequency. So if you take mode five and your fundamental is 100, then your, then your fifth mode of resonance on the string is going to be oscillating at 500 hertz or 500 times a second. So then what does the harmonic series uh, sound like? Oh, did we ever call it a harmonic series? So if you have those um, modes of resonance and you take them, these whole number ratios, right, of frequencies, and you take them as a, a series, uh, you get the harmonic series. Well, actually, the harmonic series is really a mathematical concept. It just means uh, whole number ratios, uh, numbers at whole number ratios of the, the fundamental, the first number. So uh, if, but in, in music, if you take these string modes and you play them individually, what do they sound like? Well, we'll find out. So let's look at a couple equations uh, in regards to string modes or harmonics and their relationship to each other. And let's look at the length of the string. So the length of the string is going to be equal to the node number, and it's the node number. So in this case, if we think about the fundamental or first harmonic, if that's 1, it's going to be 1 over 2 times the wavelength, right? And we can see that right here. If we look back, the wavelength of the first harmonic is actually twice the length of the string. Does that make sense? Because this is just one uh, half the cycle, and it goes like that. So it's going to be the, the length of the string. It's going to be one half the wavelength, or the wavelength is going to be two times the length of the string, right? Over n, so n over two wavelength. So if we look at mode two, or the second harmonic, right, it's going to be one n over twice the wavelength. So if this is the wavelength the size of the string, and the mode number is 2, it's going to be 2 over 2 times the wavelength, or 1 times the wavelength. I mean, 1 times the length of the string, excuse me, right? So the length of this string is going to be 1 wavelength, right? And et cetera, et cetera, for the third harmonic, it's going to be 3 over 2 of the wavelengths, right? So the length of the string it's three twos uh, of the wavelength, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's the first equation. The second equation has these intermediary things, and you can look at those. V is the speed of sound. But the most important one right here is to know that the frequency at the nth harmonic, or the nth mode, those are equivalent now. I keep using them equivalently, but they are essentially when you're talking about the string. The mode of resonance is equivalent to the harmonic number. It really is that equal to the harmonic number times the fun fundamental frequency or the frequency of the uh, first harmonic, right? And we have already discovered that. Well, so if you have a first harmonic of 440, then your second harmonic is going to be n times the first harmonic or 2, which is the node number times the first harmonic frequency, so 880. The fourth harmonic will be n, the 4 times the first harmonic, or 440. And finally, um, oops, and finally, going back to our equations, then we have a uh, wavelength, which we already talked about. It's going to be 1 over n times the wavelength of the fundamental. Okay. All right. 
So let's have a look at string harmonics. So let's uh, take a, a little look at, um, there's the sort of musical harmonics, right? And I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. When you're actually playing uh, harmonics, you lightly touch, sometimes they call it flageolet. You lightly touch a string you can cause it to change its frequency or, and also its timbre, its kind of sound. We won't talk about so much about the timbral part, but if you get a guitar, a zither, or a violin, or anything like that, and you just look at, forget about the instrument itself, but just look at sort of the string. And if you lightly touch the very center, halfway between um, you know the ends of the strings, the two ends, in, right in the middle of the string, very lightly touch that, you're gonna get, um, you're going to get uh, the second harmonic or twice the frequency okay, of the fundamental. So, and we see how that happens because physically what happens is you're touching in a node right here at mode two, right? So mode two is sounding, but you're, you're touching the antinode of mode one. So you're dampening completely mode one. So mode one doesn't sound anymore. Mode two sounds. Mode three doesn't sound anymore. Again, antinode, so it completely mutes that. But mode four sounds. So it turns out if you go all the way down the line, um, every even one or every, uh, you know, every multiple of two will sound. And so you get 220 hertz, right? And same with the third mode. If you touch one third along the way of the string, either here or here, you're going to hit a node. So you're not going to disturb the third mode at all, but you will disturb the second mode and the first mode, so you're not going to get any of those. And you will disturb the fourth mode and the fifth mode, but the sixth mode you don't disturb, right? So in fact, again, you get multiples of three. So you're hearing the third mode right here, or 330, three times the fundamental, et cetera, et cetera. And so you go on and on and on like that. Um, so if you, you can get a string and you can touch anywhere along... Um, it gets harder and harder as you get, you know, into the smaller frequencies because they don't they don't sustain as long. But you can give it a go. Here's a demonstration here um, on a little uh, I think it's like a dulcimer or something like that. Oh, on a harp. Now, the harmonic series can also be thought of as a series of ratios. There's a ratio, whole number ratio relationship between the different frequencies, obviously, because they're all whole number ratios of the fundamental or first harmonic. Now, way back in the day, Pythagoras discovered this. Apparently, uh, he was watching blacksmiths pound, um, pound uh, their metal, and they were doing it in these sort of harmonic relationships for whatever reason. And he developed this string called the Pythagorean monochord where he observed these things. Um, you know, way before strobe lights and all that other stuff. So, and, and he, he, he did talk about these ratios and he came up with these sort of almost spiritual theories about them as well. Really interesting if you want to look into that stuff. Um, but let's look at that. So uh, if you think about these whole number relationships of frequency, right? So you have your fundamental frequency and then you have the second harmonic. It, this is oscillating two times as fast as this one, right? So there's a ratio of one to two, right? So you have a one to two relationship. Well, in fact, if you take an oscillation, any oscillation, any frequency, <clears throat> and you um, take another one, another oscillation, oscillator, and you do it at twice the frequency of the original one, you're going to get an octave. Okay, so your pitches are always going to be an octave. And so we can think about these ratios or these intervals, pitch intervals, in terms of um, uh, ratio relationships too. So right here, you have between the second harmonic and the third harmonic, you have the relationship of a fifth. So if you take an oscillation and you do it uh, at, say, you know, 200, and you take another oscillation and you do it at 300, the pitch relationship between those two, two to three uh, oscillations per second, you know, two, two, whatever, uh, two times and three times ratio, you're going to get a fifth, right? So if you take something at 200 hertz, 
uh, and then you take something at 300 hertz, the relationship between those two, or 2,000 and 3,000, however you want to do it, the relationship between those two things are always going to be the musical interval of a fifth. So we have a diagram here that shows all that, and a little exclam explanation here as well. Um, so you see we have perfect fifth. Now, uh, well, I'm not going to go into this like just intonation. That's a whole can of worms. But basically, as you go up, we had to like adjust the tuning to so they everything fits in the octave so we can make something like the piano where you have these repeated octaves, right? So you start getting these very unusual intervals in the harmonic series and these just intonations. So that's what all these things like lesser tone and lesser tridecimal two-thirds tone are about. But the basic intervals are here. You have octave, perfect fifth, perfect fourth. Then you have a minor third, major third. Uh, um, and then you get into some other things as well. Okay, so again, these ratio relationships. So if you have something that oscillates five times versus something that oscillates six times ratio, you're going to have a minor third relationship, which is kind of interesting. It presents these uh, interesting mathematical to sound or music examples. Okay, so let's have a look here at, um, I've, div I've made up this little patch here, Super Collider, and... Um, if you're into Super Collider, you can see the code right there. Very simply, I've just made kind of a, a ratio um, generator. So you can, you can develop or you can generate tones based on the ratios rather than their actual frequencies. So let's do that. This is going to be a little bit loud, but I'll turn it down in the edit. Okay. Now, if I change the relationship here, well, we can change the fundamental to 60. Well, that's the MIDI note number, which is middle C, and then 2 to 3. So if we look back at our thing right here, 2 to 3 is going to be a perfect fifth, right? So I can um, make it a higher fundamental, say... Uh, Say, oh, it's not a MIDI note number. Actually, say 440. Let's do that. Okay. Or we can even just do 100 because it's actually doing two times 100 and three times 100. So you got a fifth. Let's see what I think. I see that's why it had such a low frequency. Let's see what like 11 to say uh, 19 sounds like. So that's the interval of 11 to 19. So it's interesting. It's just a different way of, instead of thinking about like ABC or uh, B flat or things like that, you can think of these intervals. And in fact, there's been composers throughout history who have done this, notably somebody like Harry Parch, who developed this whole series of uh, interval relationships or whole scales more based on ratios. And then when he notated the music, he would actually use ratios instead of notes. So we can do something like three to uh, seven or something like that. And that's the that's the ratio of that. We can make the fundamental a little higher. Okay, that's a nice sounding interval. Let's go let's go six to seven though. Okay. We can go two to thirteen. How about that? Okay. <laughs> so on and on and on you can go. It's I, I, I think this is a pretty interesting patch. Uh, so download Super Collider and copy my code there. There you go. All right, so um, on to the next little mini topic here. Let's talk about why then, if we have all these modes of resonance or these harmonics sounding all at the same time, well, let, let's just address that. Let's address that principle first. We'll back it up just one little step. And in fact, as you can see, as you've learned, uh, when, you, when you oscillate a string, you're getting several modes of resonance or several modes of oscillation happening all at the same time, right? Or you see here. But in fact, you're just getting one single output, right? So when we when we play a string, you're not getting the, all these separate outputs. They're all being combined. And remember, constructive and destructive interference. They're all being combined, adding and subtracting to each other. And so you get this composite waveform. And this is what, later on, you'll, we'll learn a little bit more about this, but this is what we call the time domain. So this is a representation of the change in pressure over time, right? And in fact, this is what's coming out your speakers. These changes of pressure, or this is what's in the air. But what this represents is all these waveforms all added up together. So it's a composite waveform. So anytime you, you pluck a string, 
you're going to get this kind of composite waveform. There, to, more or less, depending on, there's other factors like density and stiffness of the string and stuff like that that do warp the actual harmonic series. So in, in actual life, there's no string instrument that's going to give us a perfect harmonic series, but more or less we get something like this. And when you pluck the string, it's going to combine uh, all the harmonic or all the modes of resonance into this one composite waveform they add together. Um, now, another thing to realize is that oftentimes uh, the, the amplitude of the subsequent harmonics are quite a bit less. So you get the fundamental, and it's going to be by far the loudest uh, harmonic. And then by, even by the time you get to the second harmonic, the amplitude of that one, and it's not reflected in this diagram, but the amplitude is going to be quite a bit quieter than the first one, and then the third quite a bit quieter than that, the fourth quite a bit quieter as you go on. So by the time you get pretty high into the harmonic series, some of those things aren't heard. Now with more, um, with different kind of instruments, sometimes instruments have uh, internal resonances or some, or like the human voice, for example, has, has these things called formants, which emphasize certain frequencies uh, up along the harmonic series, or sometimes they're not even part of the actual harmonic series. And so then uh, you'll, get, you'll get peaks at certain harmonics and then that, will affect this composite waveform as well. So let's have a look at, there's this little applet here, this Java applet that you can add kind of a, let's see, sine, cosine. Okay, you can add these things. So this is like all the different modes, you know, the end numbers, all the different modes are the different harmonics, all right? And then this will show the individual harmonics there, and then it'll show some waveform. So one thing you'll notice is if I add, and these are just harmonic, remember harmonic ratios, so those, this will be two times the frequency. If I add just a little bit of uh, mode two or uh, the second harmonic, right? You'll see them there, that's an orange, that's mode, that's the second mode. We add a little bit of the third mode or third harmonic, add a little bit of the fourth harmonic add a little bit of the fifth harmonic, etc. Let's just go on down the line. And let's see what happens. Uh, they start adding together and subtracting whatnot and basically cause this composite waveform, right? But you'll notice one thing interesting is all these, these different um, harmonics end up reinforcing the fundamental frequency or the first harmonic, right? So even though this looks a little different, its periodicity is gonna be equal, or its frequency is gonna be equal actually to the first harmonic, all right? It's still gonna repeat at that frequency, even though you have a lot of different repeated frequencies. That's all due to this constructive and destructive interference and the, the, the harmonic nature, the whole number ratio nature of all these upper harmonics. So it reinforces the fundamental, so that's why when you play a violin string or you play a guitar string, you don't hear like a chord, right? You don't hear a bunch of separate tones altogether. You just hear one tone and it happens to be at the frequency of the fundamental. You hear the, the basic lowest tone, right? Because all the above harmonics will reinforce the fundamental frequency. So then what's what good are these? Well, uh, in the next uh, video. In the next part, we're going to explore this in some depth, and it's taken us a while to get here. But basically, these affect the timbre or the sound color. So all the sort of subsequent harmonics up here are going to make a guitar sound like a guitar, or a violin sound like a violin, or a tuba sound like a tuba, etc. And it's that particular recipe or cocktail of these upper partials. So sometimes in, for example, like a bell or something like that, you don't get a harmonic series, but you still have the principle stills the same as you have some kind of like basic frequency or some, in the case of a bell, oftentimes it's two or three basic frequencies. And then you have a bunch of partials above or harmonics above. In this case, they're not harmonics because they're in harmonic. They're, they don't follow the harmonic series. So we'll just call them partials or overtones, a, a load of partials and overtones above. And it causes that distinct kind of timbre, that distinct sound quality. So that's why, again, a cello can sound like a cello and like, um, you know, koto can sound like a koto. Okay. Um, so, right. So let's just very quickly look at some of these. Um, let's take it to, so when we're looking at a string, uh, it's just this 1D representation. But with uh, plates, such as... Uh, 
you know, like things like a timpani or, um, you know, any kind of percussion instrument or even like um, uh, mallet instruments like the marimba or the vibraphone and stuff like that. There's a 2D shape, right? And we won't get too much into it, but I just want to introduce you to the concept that it becomes much more complex. So instead of this very neat kind of string, this 1D, you know, up and down modes of resonance, you get these more complex modes of resonance. And that's what actually forms those uh, Claudini patterns that we saw so, so much with the sand and stuff. Right, so here you'll see the, you know, these oscillations, modes of oscillations. So the, let's, the dark hairs will presume is, you know, um, uh, antinode, you know, it's coming up and, and that's going down. So while this is going up, this is going down. So while these two are going up, these two are going down, et cetera, these. So that's what we would call the fourth mode. These two going up, these two going down, and et cetera, et cetera. And it gets quite complex. You can keep going and going and going. So let's look at the, um, uh, a violin. Plate, so we'll call these plate modes of resonance, but let's look at violin and see how that looks. Yeah, so the way Claudini patterns work is, you know, where there are nodes, that means no movement in the plate, that's where the salt is going to collect, right? And this is moving here, and this is moving in these really, really interesting shapes, and that's why these Claudini patterns are so beautiful, yet all along here is going to be a node. So if you compare that to the string modes, you know, where you have simple, like, one-dimensional nodes, here you have those very complex shapes. And so that's what makes, gives it violin that particular color. So the, the two different plates, yeah, instrumental acoustics are really fascinating. I would, I would recommend looking into it. Uh, you have two different plates. The bottom plate has its own modes. It's made of a different material. And then the top plate of the violin has a different set of modes. And then, in fact, the resonance within the violin has this um, uh, its own modes as well. It's an air cavity. It's called Helmholtz resonance. Uh, and it has its own kind of modes of things. So you get all these combinations and you get this very rich color and very, you know, powerful sound from a violin. All right. Well, thanks for hanging in there. This was kind of a long one, but uh, really important concepts. We're getting more and more complex as we try to understand, as we're trying to understand sound. Uh, and next time we're going to go ahead and tackle timbre. We're really leading up to the idea that timbre or sound color is built up of this, what we're going to call a spectrum. Uh, a number of different tones above the pitch or the fundamental tone that we listen to. Okay, so join us for the next part.